Okay, so uh, here we go. Uh, we're uh, picking up where we left off last time. Okay, so uh, here we go. Uh, we, we've got uh, uh, what I'm going to call a local test um, to an important question. Uh, the question is, if I have a vector field, how can I decide if that vector field is or is not a gradient of something? Right? So this, this is important because um, if it is a gradient of something, then I can find the anti-gradient. I can use the fundamental theorem of line integrals. That's very, really valuable to, to be able to do. Um, also, likewise, and uh, we've, we've already talked about this, the question of whether it is or is not a gradient is equivalent to the question of whether it's path independent. Path independent, again, is a useful property in various different ways. So uh, what is that local test? And uh, what I'm going to call the local test is right here. It says compute Green's operator and see if you get zero. If you do get zero, then that is a gradient of something. Regularity issues aside, we don't want to worry about uh, regularity issues. Um, and if you don't get zero, then it is not a gradient of anything. So don't try to find the anti-gradient. It doesn't exist. Right? So again, important to know which of these is the case. And Green's operator is the test that does it. Now, uh, how does this work? Um, there's a wonderful little argument that uh, shows how this works. Um, uh, recall, we've already talked about these three conditions here all being equivalent. Being a gradient, again, we talked before about how that's equivalent to path independence. And we've also talked about how path independence can be interpreted in different ways, one of which is all closed line integrals have to be zero. Right? And that's uh, sort of an alternative point of view on path independence. Uh, said differently, uh, all circulations are all zero. Same statement, different phrasing. Okay, so these three conditions are the same. All right, now that noted, let's point out where Green's theorem connects here. Green's theorem says that closed line integrals, boundary line integrals, are double integrals of Green's operator. So the statement that closed line integrals, aka circulations, all have to be zero is equivalent then to the statement that all double integrals of Green's operator all have to be zero. Totally equivalent statements, again, because these circulations are these double integrals. Is everybody on board? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, okay. Now, wh what are we going to do with this statement right here? Uh, how could how could it be that uh, all double integrals of Green's operator always zero? This is for every domain, all possible domains. Double integrals always zero. Uh, seems outrageous. In fact, there's really only one way this is possible. There's only one possible function here. This integrand, Green's operator, there's only one thing that that could be. There's only one function this could be where all of the double integrals for every domain are all zero, and that is if this integrand itself is zero. And thus, that's uh, th there's our local test. That's how our that's how we draw that conclusion. Okay, so I think this is a uh, wonderful theorem, uh, very convenient. We're going to do some examples in just a minute. I want to give you a couple more things before we move on. Uh, first of all, this term right here, uh, Green's operator being zero, is sometimes referred to as the vector field being irrotational. Um, I think this is a lovely term. I'm a fan. Uh, and let me explain why. Uh, let's remind ourselves, what is it that Green's operator represents? And um, I recall when we were first talking about Green's theorem, Green's operator represents circulation density. Right? It represents locally near a given point where you might be looking. To what extent is there kind of a rotation within the fluid? Right? To what extent, if I were to drop a leaf into the fluid, would that leaf start to turn? Right? So Green's operator is a reference to the rotational aspect of the fluid. And if that is zero, then irrotational makes sense. I think it's extremely natural, very descriptive, and a nice, uh, nice feature, nice way of thinking about how this condition works. Uh, a vector field is a gradient 
regularity issues aside, vector field is a gradient if it is irrotational. Okay. All right. The other thing I want to give you on this, and this is, again, just an alternative point of view. You don't have to think about it this way. Um, uh, both of these statements here, this statement and, uh, and this statement, uh, can be thought of in terms of circulations. Uh, so being a gradient is a statement, arguably, about circulations being zero. Uh, in what sense? Well, because gradients, because of path independence, means that as you keep track of how the function's changing as you move around the boundary, um, that has to add up to zero on a closed curve. So this is a statement about circulations being zero thought of from the point of view of the boundary. Whereas, now let's look at this statement here. I claim this too is a statement about circulations having to be zero. This time thought of in terms of how circulations accumulate over the interior. Right? So uh, both connect to this idea of there being no circulations, one from the point of view of the boundary, one from the point of view of the interior, and uh, thus their equivalent statement. So that's a little bit more sort of hand wavy and intuitive, and it might appeal to you more, it might appeal to you less, uh, but it's an a, a alternative equivalent way of thinking about it. Okay. All right, now let's um, uh, proceed along. Um, the, uh, the catch on this theorem is it only applies in two dimensions. Uh, that's the only place that Green's theorem applies. That's the only place Green's theorem does any business at all. Okay. So what if we're in three dimensions? It turns out that in three dimensions you can do something morally equivalent. And a vector field is a gradient if and only if. Again, there's a local test. This time the local test is the curl. And whether the curl is or isn't zero. Um, there is a really analogous argument that justifies this statement. Uh, it involves a tool, it involves a theorem, much like Green's theorem. And recall the purpose of Green's theorem here was uh, to make this connection uh, between uh, circulations and a, and a sort of an integral. Uh, underneath this blue statement, again, there's an argument that again involves a theorem. And it's not Green's theorem, but it's sort of a three-dimensional analog of Green's theorem. We don't have that theorem yet. So we, I can't show you that argument, but it's when we do, once we have the appropriate theorem, when I show you the analogous argument, it's going to look just like this, just kind of a three-dimensional equivalent. Okay. All right. Um, so here we go. Let's ask this question here. Is that vector field a gradient? Maybe I need to do a vector line integral of this vector field, and I want to know if I should go to the trouble of trying to find an anti-gradient. Or is that going to be a wild goose chase? Right? Or uh, maybe I want to make a path independence argument, and I, it's not clear if this vector field is path independent. Can I use path independence here? Uh, a couple of reasons I might want to know the answer to this question. Uh, and at a quick glance, it is not immediately, it doesn't leap off the page at us uh, how I would whether there is an anti-gradient. So I'm going to use the uh, three-dimensional test up here. Notice uh, three dimensions. Right? The test is curl. So being as we are, in fact, in three dimensions, uh, I'm going to compute the curl. Uh, don't forget there's a uh, formula for curl. Back in Chapter 3, make sure that you know that formula for curl. It is a vector. It has three components. And it's uh, various partials minus various other partials uh, in the various components. And again, make sure you remember those details. Uh, that said, when you start to write down the curl for this, the very first coordinate you write down is already not zero. Um, I guess I could go ahead and compute the second and third coordinates, but I don't really need to. I already know by looking at this first coordinate that there's no way that this curl is going to end up being the zero vector. So question already decided. Right. Now, th real quick, um, had I gotten zero here, the question would not have been decided. I would then have to proceed to the other, the other coordinates. Right. All right, but uh, not zero, game over. This is definitely not a gradient. It's definitely not path independent. Don't waste your try time trying to find an anti-gradient. There isn't one. 
you won't find it. Okay. All right, let's see a two-dimensional version of this. There we go. Let's ask if this right here is a gradient. Now, again, we have a local test. This being two-dimensional, our test is Green's operator, which is this formula right here. Plug and chug. Green's operator is 2, which is not 0. It's not 0, and so therefore there is not an anti-gradient. So again, don't try to find one. Does that make sense to everybody? Um, just a little bit of geometric intuition uh, <clears throat> before we go on. Uh, recall, we've already talked about this vector field. We've drawn a picture of it. It looks like this. And I am going to make a geometric appeal here that uh, this picture basically says, well, of course this couldn't be a gradient. After all, if this were a gradient, keeping in mind, gradients point uphill. Can all of these vectors all be pointing uphill? What would that mountain look like where all of these vectors are pointing uphill? Right? And it is nonsense. It's absolutely not possible. If this were, in fact, the shape of a mountain, then as I, if I park my car right there and then I go on a hike while I'm going up, 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 higher and higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. Wait a minute. Now I'm back at my car. I've been going uphill the whole time. <laughs> right? Something's creepy uh, if, uh, if, the, if that happens. Right? right. Uh, which, by the way, is kind of the whole point of the Escher stairs. Same, same deal. All right. Okay, moving along. Um, so now there's a, a weird conversation we have to, we have, to have here. Um, uh, so, oh gosh. So there are, th there's a bunch of stuff about multivariable calculus that I can't tell y'all. Um, it's, uh, it's too advanced and sophisticated, et cetera, but gosh, it's handy. It's really powerful, really useful. Um, there are powerful and remarkable results that come about because of these more sophisticated things that I can't tell you. Um, so what do we do in a situation like this? And I'll tell you what my sort of compromise is, is uh, I've taken some of these sophisticated advanced, scary, intimidating uh, ideas, and I've uh, boiled off all the formality and the rigor and the scary and left it with just kind of a strategy, sort of a, a structure, an arrangement of uh, how to sort of a bookkeeping system uh, for your mind, if nothing else, of how to think about the various ideas that we're talking about. And because of all of the underlying powerful ideas that, again, we're not going to talk about, if you follow this pattern, if you arrange things in this certain way, um, this stuff just works out. And it's just super convenient and super handy. And uh, it, it's just, it makes understanding these ideas um, fall into patterns that are easy to notice and very nice to be able to take advantage of. So uh, the, uh, the, the pattern, the, the, what I call the diagram, uh, that uh, that results again when you boil off all the formalities from these uh, certain more sophisticated constructions is uh, something along the lines of what I have here. But uh, I'm going to work instead. Uh, whoops, uh, I'm going to work instead on a different version of this diagram, a little bit more sort of full uh, version of this diagram that I have uh, here. By the way, this page. Um, this uh, PDF file is on the website in one of the class materials uh, folders. Um, at the same place where you find the lecture notes, it's called diagram.pdf. Uh, and uh, I encourage you to go ahead and download that file. It's very, very handy for these purposes. Okay, so uh, a couple of things to say. We've already talked about the, uh, the whole lifetime theorems uh, thing. If you compose gradient and Green's operator in that order, then everything has a lifetime of two. Uh, in fact, We've just gotten through talking about the local test, which tells us, in fact, the same thing. If you have a vector field, and if you want to know if uh, this is or is not a gradient of something, take Green's operator and see if you do or don't get zero. That's the, so you can view this as a lifetime theorem thing on the point of view of the diagram. You can view it as a local test thing. Um, from the point of view of what we were talking about before. Okay. All right. 
Um, let's see here. Let's talk about our accumulation theorems. We have the fundamental theorem of line integrals that I like to draw like this. We have Green's theorem that I like to draw like this. Let me walk you through how these appear on the diagram. Um, by the way, notice we've got double integrals, kind of what you might call in this column, the idea being that if you have a function and a two-dimensional region, then you can compute a double integral over that region of that function. And then uh, likewise, if you have a uh, vector field and a curve, then you can do a vector line integral. You have the appropriate domain, appropriate internet, et cetera. Uh, you can take a function and plug in a point like so. OK. Um, notice there's kind of a diagram of sorts on these domains as well. Uh, Two-dimensional on the right one-dimensional in the middle, zero-dimensional points over here on the left, little pattern, thus these numbers here, by the way, zero, one, and two, referencing the dimension. And then furthermore, notice, we can talk about how boundaries relate these things. If you give me a two-dimensional region in the plane, its boundary will be a curve, typically. Okay? And likewise, if you have a curve, in the plane, its boundary will be made up out of points, typically a starting point and an ending point. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the fundamental theorem of line integrals. With everything set up as we have here, and again, this is seemingly arbitrary. Um, we can't talk about why this all comes from these more sophisticated tools. Okay, fundamental theorem of line integrals. <coughs> says that if you have a function and you look at its gradient, if you have a curve and you look at its boundary points, A and B, then if you evaluate this function on those boundary points, like so, versus if you do a vector line integral of the gradient of your original function, on that original curve whose boundary points you plugged in a second ago, like so, then you get the same thing on both sides. Right now, just for uh, sort of ease of, uh, you know, kind of moving things around, I like to view this as an arrow to the right there, an arrow to the left here, evaluate down the columns, you get the same thing on both sides. Okay, now let's put a pin in that. Not clear why that's particularly interesting the way we have it, right? But uh, let's do the analogous thing now for Green's theorem. Uh, Green's theorem says that if you have a vector field and you compute Green's operator, if you take a two-dimensional region and you look at its boundary curve, then the line integral of your vector field around your boundary, like so, and the double integral of Green's operator over your original region, like so, are always equal. That's what Green's theorem says. So it follows this same pattern. It's kind of phenomenal how analogous the pattern is. Push to the right, push to the left, evaluate on both sides, same. And that exact same pattern is the pattern that describes the fundamental theorem of line integrals. Right? Now, this got noticed uh, long, long ago. Right? Well, as these theorems were coming out, people very quickly realized, hey, wait a minute. Wow, what are the odds? There's a lot of similarities here. Right? The, this theorem here has all the same earmarks of this theorem here. Surely there's a connection between them. And this was a uh, sort of a mystery for a, quite a long time. And it was ultimately fairly recently that this got resolved. It was less than 100 years ago. I'm going to say it's the 1930s or 40s, something like that. I don't remember the exact time. Um, but a pretty modern development when people finally realized how to actually connect these theorems. And that's the sophisticated stuff I can't talk to you about. Right? I mean, after all, anything that Gauss didn't understand, we're not going to mess with in this class. Right? Um, so, uh, 
Uh, anyway, even though I can't tell you the full story, I do think there's tremendous value in uh, suggesting that as you work through these ideas, as you understand these ideas, kind of get intuition for uh, uh, various different things that we talk about in this context, keep this pattern in mind. Um, this is the background on which all of my intuition for multivariable calculus is all sort of in the context of this pattern. Okay, now uh, last thing I want to point out, there are some special vector fields. Uh, let's see here, uh, where, here we go. Special vector fields that we've talked about, um, AKA gradients. Vector fields that are gradients. Some vector fields are, some vector fields aren't. In fact, in some sense, most vector fields aren't. Right? So a vector field being a gradient, that's a special property. Uh, we've uh, furthermore talked about how these uh, vector fields are irrotational. That's our local test. Green's operator has to be zero. And we've also, uh, yesterday, or uh, uh, Monday, uh, talked about how gradients are all pattern independent. So three different properties of the same collection of special vector fields. And so I like to draw a picture of what do these properties look like on our diagram. Uh, and uh, there's a nice little pattern that emerges. Now these special vector fields live here. Again, they are the ones that are gradients of something. They are the ones that are irrotational, namely for which Green's operator is zero. They are the ones that are path independent. Now here's how I represent path independence on this diagram. This is just uh, what makes sense to me, but path independence means that if you have two curves, different curves, whose boundary points are the same, then you always get the same value for the vector line. So th this is, in my mind, this is how I think about these three properties, the three um, uh, sort of different properties of the same special vector fields. And you might say to yourself, okay, I don't really see the value of seeing that in this way. Uh, I'm going to try to persuade you that it's valuable by pointing out that there is a three-dimensional version of this two-dimensional diagram we've been looking at. This three-dimensional version, we don't have all the tools yet to be able to talk about what's going on in here. We will soon, uh, but uh, we don't quite have the tools yet. That said, um, <clears throat> here's a little bit of foreshadowing. This pattern of, for special vector fields in two dimensions, same pattern holds in three dimensions. That might be a little bit of an eyebrow razor for you, right? Like, okay, wow, well that's, not obvious and a little bit a little bit surprising but even more surprising than that there's another collection of special vector fields that moves over one dimension vector fields that are curls of other vector fields are also vector fields for which the divergence is zero which are also vector fields for which there is kind of a surface equivalent of path independence. And again, we don't have the tools to talk about that yet, so I won't be able to fill in the blanks. But again, I think that's a that's a kind of a jaw dropper to me that, that uh, this pattern about very special vector fields, in some sense, one dimension, that the same pattern, totally different geometry, totally different statements, it's divergence instead of Green's operator, et cetera, et cetera, totally different statements, but the pattern it's exactly the same. Very handy uh, to notice. Okay. All right. So enough of that. And uh, we've kind of talked through uh, all that stuff. So I'm going to move on now to the last little bit of 6.3, um, how to find anti-gradients. Uh, you may recall I've kind of waved my hands at this previously. We saw an example Monday, when we when we first wrote down the fundamental theorem of line integrals, and I just pulled an anti gradient out of thin air. And here's the anti gradient. You can check that I'm right, right? But it was a magic trick as to where I found it. 
how do you find it in practice? Here's the big idea. If you have a vector field and if you want to know how to view that as being a gradient of something, you can just write that exact statement in terms of coordinates. I need the coordinates of f to be the coordinates of the gradient. Same statement. That is three separate statements about partial derivatives. And so what I have here then, uh, the, you know, my goal is to find this function, whatever this function is, f, whose x partial is p, the y partial is q, and the z partial is r. Okay. Now, statements about partials can equivalently be rephrased as statements about anti-partials. So I, these are morally the same statements here. Um, if f has its x partial being p, another way to say that is that f is the x anti-partial of p. Right? It's uh, derivatives and anti-derivatives, right? I mean, it's just uh, it's uh, almost kind of like passive tense versus active tense in, in, in language. Right? This is really the same statement. We're talking about a relationship between f and p. One's the derivative of the other. The other is the antiderivative of the one. Is everybody cool with that? Okay. All right. Now, here's the thing. Uh, this, um, this x antipartial uh, whoops, that I claim is f. What I should really say is, uh, look, this is a thing. Don't forget, we're talking about uh, taking an x partial of it. What I really need is a function that when I take the x partial gives me p. Well, when I take the x partial, um, anything, uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, let me, okay, let me do it like this. Okay, Anything where when I take the x partial, I get 0 is free. Right, so... The, the x antipartial of p already makes me get the answer that I need, but if I were to throw in some function of y and z, as long as it doesn't have x's in it, any function of y and z, when I take that x partial, I'm going to get 0. So I can add in any function of y and z for free, anything that I want. The world is my oyster. Is that cool? Everybody happy with that? All right, so now likewise, of course, for the y partial and the z partial. And so what we really have, it's not that uh, I need f to equal to this and this and that. That's not really quite true. When you find antipartials, you're finding arbitrary antipartials. Same, same with single variable derivatives. When you find an antiderivative, you're just finding an antiderivative. There's a bunch of them. You get to pick whichever one you want, right? So don't forget to put in that plus C. This is the multivariable calculus equivalent of the plus C. It's just that now they are functions of the other variables. All right, so what I really need, if I want these three things to be true, and thus for this vector field to be a gradient, if I want that to be true, all I really need is for these three things all to be the same. I get to pick any functions that I want in these places here. So try to get as clever as you can, right? And just try to find functions to put in these spots that will make these three things all equal to each other. And let me show you one in practice. Um, here we go. Okay, so uh, here's a vector field. How would I find an anti-gradient for that vector field? Following the formula on the previous page, I need to take the first coordinate, take the x antipartial. The second coordinate, I need to take the y antipartial. And the third coordinate, I need to take the z antipartial. Right, just totally following this on the previous page. Okay, now. Uh, 
Those are easy anti-partials. Nothing to it. I get these. Easy algebra. And by the way, I just wrote certain terms in certain places just for kind of uh, visual convenience that you're going to notice in just a second. Um, so, okay, uh, but uh, keep in mind, I also get to add in these terms here for free. I get to pick these C1, C2, and C3 functions. I get to pick them to be whatever I want them to be to try to make this work. Um, and good thing, too, right, because if I, if I only had this, and if I needed the, all three of these functions to be equal to each other, well, that's just, that's just flat false, right? They're clearly not the same. Again, that's not the question. The question isn't whether these three things are equal. The question is whether I can make these three things equal. And the game begins. Uh, I, I, now, I, strategically, I, I see there's an x squared y right there. Uh, all three of these lines are going to need to be equal to each other. Uh, good news, I see an x squared y right there. Okay, things are starting to check out. I, we got a uh, consistency there. But I sadly don't have an x squared y right there. And so I'm discouraged, uh, concerned that we might lose this game. But keep in mind, I get to pick these constants to be whatever I want them to be. And I'm going to choose for strategic purposes to make this x squared y. Now I've got x squared y on each line. Everybody good? And the game continues. I got an xz there. I got an xz there. Disappointed I don't have an xz there, but I can make this xz. Keep in mind, I get to pick this to be any function of x and z only that I want. So x times z, perfectly fine. And then, et cetera, minus yz squared minus yz squared. And how about this? I'll make this minus yz squared. Um, so good news, we win. Um, these three things are already all equal to each other. They're all equal to <coughs> green plus orange plus blue, and so we have ourselves an anti-gradient. <coughs> and you can totally confirm that this works as very uh, direct calculation. Uh, let me eh, get rid of the mess here. Uh, take this function, compute its gradient, x partial, y partial, z partial, and they all work. Everybody happy? All righty. All right, now, um, one thing that made this possible to find an anti-gradient is that there is an anti-gradient, right? Again, you can't find stuff if it doesn't exist. doesn't matter how clever you are. If something doesn't exist, you cannot find it. Right? So uh, how did I know this anti-gradient existed? Well, I did my local test, took the curl. I got zero. So I knew the anti-gradient existed, and I knew this wouldn't be a wild goose chase. Uh, that would end in uh, sadness. Uh, so, uh, but what happens if you do? What happens if you play the game to find an anti-gradient when in fact it doesn't exist? How do you lose this game? And here's a great little example. Um, here's a vector field that we've already discussed. We've already established. Green's operator is not zero. There is no anti-gradient to be found. Doesn't matter how clever you are. Doesn't matter how good you are at the game. Right? There is no anti-gradient to find. Well, let's see how the game <coughs> plays out. First coordinate, take the x antipartial. Second coordinate, y antipartial. Don't forget about your constants. Right? This thing here can be anything that has no x's in it, so this could be any function of y. This could be anything that has no y's in it, so any function of x. The game begins. Uh, can I find a function that's equal to both of these things? And you're going to lose that game. And it's pretty easy to see how you've painted yourself into a corner, right? In some sense, I need the difference of these two functions to be 2xy. <coughs> and I just can't. 
because this is only a function of y, this is only a function of x, and I just can't uh, kind of mix them together. Is that cool? All right. Okay, so that's how that works, and we are done with Chapter 6. Uh, we're moving on to Chapter 7 now. Um, Let's see here, a couple of quick things I want to say about Chapter 7 overall. Chapter 7 is, in the big scheme of things, a lot like Chapter 6. The big tools that we found in Chapter 6 were what I like to call, as you all know, accumulation theorems. Right. So we noticed that circulation is an accumulating quantity. It accumulates over areas. It was unexpected observation. But with that observation about it being an accumulating quantity, the whole is the sum of the parts, blah, 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 density, blah, blah, double integral theorem. Right? Okay. Then we made the observation that outward-oriented boundary flux is an accumulating quantity. And again, you can make an argument about, uh, you know, whole of the sum of the parts and densities, et cetera. And then, bam, two-dimensional divergence theorem. Then we made the observation that change, thought of as something defined on a curve, change is an accumulating quantity. And uh, again, uh, accumulation holds some of the parts, densities, and theorem. We found several of these theorems, in other words. What we're going to see in Chapter 7 is that there are more accumulating quantities to be noticed and more theorems that result. Um, and in order to be able to do so, we do have to fill in some blanks. I've already made a reference here on the diagram. Let, let me go down here to the, the three-dimensional diagram. Uh, we have, uh, <clears throat> we already have most of the objects that we need. We know how to plug points into functions. We know how to do vector line integrals. We know how to do triple integrals. But we don't know what this is right here yet. Uh, we just haven't discussed what it might mean to do an integral on a surface. Well, okay, so we're going to have to fill in that blank. We're going to have to figure out what is a surface integral. What also might it mean to do a surface integral of a vector field? What's the motivation there? What is this? How do we visualize this? What does it look like? What does it relate to physically? And once we have that filled in, then we're going to be able to write down more of these accumulation theorems, and uh, you've already seen this pattern where, uh, you know, to the right, to the left, down on both sides, you get the same thing. What we're going to see, and, you know, just again, a little bit of foreshadowing, that same pattern holds over here, and it's called Gauss's Divergence Theorem, and it holds kind of here in the middle, a little bit of a weirder result here, but... Uh, this is called Stokes' curl theorem. So um, different geometry, different algebra, different context. But morally, it's Green's theorem. Just kind of, you know, interpreted appropriate to the context, all of the context of which is different. Okay. All right. So now uh, back to figuring out what surface integrals are. Okay, so we're going to go um, to uh, the beginning of 7.1. I have to tell you what a parametric surface is. I'm going to do this by reminding you what a parametric curve is. This goes all the way back to early chapter 1, long ago, right? The good old days. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, so what was the parameterization of a curve? Well, a parametric curve gives position as a function of one parameter. Position is a function of just a single parameter. A side note, we, we tend to think of that parameter as being time. Um, and if the parameter is time, then we have position as a function of time. That literally describes the process of drawing a curve. Right? And so that's a nice metaphor, very handy. Um, just a quick reminder there. So, okay, position as a function of a single parameter. Well, a parametric surface, very closely analogous. That's where you have position as a function of two parameters. That's all there is to it. It's the same basic idea. <coughs> We're going to describe the actual points on this geometric object. 
It's just that we're going to describe them in terms of two parameters instead of one. So uh, here's an example. In fact, this is an example we've seen before. This also goes back to, uh, to chapter 1, section 1.5. You want to, you know, flip back and remind yourself. Um, but uh, we have already parameterized a plane as follows. Uh, let's see here. I'll start with, uh, yeah, okay, red. Let's suppose I have, suppose I'm given a point in my plane. And suppose that I'm also given two vectors parallel to my plane. After all, look, I do need to know what plane are we talking about, right? You're going to have to give me some specifics about the plane before I can actually write down algebra for it. So I'm going to say, look, we're interested in the plane that goes through that point and that's parallel to these two vectors. That's my plane in question. How do we trace out? How do I, how do I generate an arbitrary point on this plane given just what we have there? So the big idea is that from my red point, I can go arbitrarily far in the v1 direction by multiplying v1 by some parameter s. And then from there, I can go arbitrarily far in the v2 direction by scaling v2 by some parameter t. And so that does it, actually. Let me get this out of the way. Uh, red plus dark green plus dark blue takes me from whatever <coughs> given starting point I have, x naught, and allows me to get to anywhere else in the plane that I want to be. Right? Just pick it, you know, uh, uh, appropriate values of s and t. You can get anywhere in the plane you want to go. Everybody kind of buy that? If you change the values of S and T, you can just go anywhere you want. Okay, so uh, do notice that we have here two parameters. Parameters being S and T. And as a result, I get a two-dimensional surface, in this case a plane. All right. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah, real quick, I do need to, I have to point out the, the disappointment here. Um, since you have two parameters, they can't both be time, <laughs> right? I mean, it'd be, that'd be a weird, crazy sci-fi movie, right? Uh, I don't think I'd be able to follow that movie. Um, <laughs> it's very unnatural, right? So you do have to abandon that idea. It's one of our favorite things about parametric curves is that you can just think of, ah, oh, the parameter, just think of that as being time. Okay, well, we have two of them now. So, so sadly, you can't think of those as being time. You have to think of them as just being arbitrary parameters that move you according to the specifics of whatever your algebra is. Okay. All right. Okay, moving along. How do we create parameterizations? Um, this, uh, kind of like parametric curves, this is not a purely algorithmic thing. Um, I'm going to be able to give you various tools for your uh, parametric surfaces toolbox. And when you find yourself in the real world and uh, dealing with some sort of a problem, you just have to kind of look and ask which of the tools fits best with the scenario that I'm actually uh, dealt with and uh, what tools can I use to, to, to do this. Um, so uh, like I say, it's not algorithmic. Uh, use each of these tools wherever you can, wherever it fits. Okay, so here we go. First tool, graph parameterizations. Now recall we've talked about graph parameterizations of curves before. The big idea of a graph, again back to early chapter one here, um, if you have a graph, right, in other words if you have one variable solved for as a function of the other, the big trick to the graph parameterization was whatever is your input variable, let that be your parameter. And then everything just falls into place. It's just, you're basically, you've already won the game if you follow that simple rule, right? So one variable is a function of the other. 
That other that is the input variable is your parameter. Details follow. Okay, I claim the same thing works in this new context. Now, if we're talking about a graph, for example, here I have z as a function of the others, plural now. Right now I have, we're talking about surfaces, so we have two input variables. The simple rule is the same. Whatever are your input variables, let those be your parameters. Simple as that. The game's already won. You just have to kind of let it play out. So uh, here we go. Let's see an example. Um, <clears throat> let's look at this surface right here. Paraboloid. Everybody remembers this from Chapter 2. It's a paraboloid. Uh, notice that it is a graph. One of the variables solved for in terms of the others. The input variables, x and y. I'm going to follow my own rule. I'm going to make x and y my parameters, s and t. I claim we've already won the game. Because if x and y are s and t, then z kind of has to be s squared plus t squared. And again, victory because I have position as a function of two parameters s and t. That is, that is the definition of a parametric surface. Everybody good? Pretty straightforward? Everybody's happy with that? Okay, now uh, notice there's no law that says it has to be z being a function of x and y, and it's also no law that says that the curve, excuse me, that the surface has to come already understood as a graph. So another example, Here, here's a surface. It's an equation involving three variables. So we know that this is a surface of some sort and uh, not given as a graph. Can I, can I solve for z as a function of x and y? I don't think so, because there's a cubed and there's a z inside of the exponential. We can't really solve for z. You likewise can't solve for x but you can totally solve for y, no problem. And so again, we have a graph. This time y is a function of x and z. And with y being a function of x and z, uh, again, my input variables, x and z, I'm gonna let those be the parameters. So, of the three coordinates that I'm looking for, X and Z are already decided. X and Z are just S and T. And then, uh, again, kind of game over because if X is S and Z is T, then Y unavoidably has to be that right there that you get from having solved for Y already. And parameterization, position as a function of S and T. How are we doing? Is everybody happy? Okay. Okay, one last version of this I'm going to show you. Uh, is It's a little bit different, but it's, it's in a way kind of morally equivalent. Uh, and that is uh, you can do something a lot like this in other coordinate systems. So um, I'm going to say that what we've been doing are rectangular graphs parameterizations because these are rectangular graphs because we have solved for one of the rectangular variables in terms of the other rectangular variables, right? So what happens if you have one of the, for example, spherical variables solved for in terms of the other two spherical variables? And a lot of people uh, will, uh, will uh, hey, wait a second, this seems to be a function of only one. I like to think of it as, but it's also a function of both phi and theta. It's just a really easy function of theta. That theta just doesn't matter, right? So it's still a function of phi and theta. Okay. So uh, what do you do? And the answer is, again, that it's already done. We've already won the game. Just plug in what you know into your conversion formulas. And what I have here circled is the spherical to rectangular conversion formulas. If you give me the spherical coordinates, this tells me how to find the rectangular coordinates and just plug in your spherical graph. We have an explicit formula for rho. It is cosine theta. 
All right. Stick it on in there. Victory. We've already won. I have, in fact, then position as a function of two parameters. And the two parameters this time are called phi and theta. Um, <clears throat> I suppose you could rename those S and T if you want to. It doesn't. You don't really need to. They're distinct from my output variables. By the way, the only reason I replace, for example, X and Y up here with S and T is because it's poor form to have a variable be both inputs and outputs in, of the same function. That's that's a danger of confusion of variables, and I just I don't think it's good form. Uh, but uh, here, no such need. Already done. Again, hardly had to do anything. Really powerful trick. We'll draw the line right here. Y'all have a good rest of your Wednesday. See you later. See you on Friday.